troops in Aleppo uh, just in July. Thank you, Ambassador Power, and I'm really honored and humbled to be here. But frankly, I prefer to be in Aleppo with my colleagues um, to help in treating the patients uh, that are under severe stress than being here. I'm a critical care specialist, I'm not a politician, and I'm here because I'm a physician and a humanitarian. I'm here because the lives of 300,000 people in Eastern Aleppo and probably one million people in Western Aleppo are at stake. They are under siege in Eastern Aleppo. I really thank Ambassador Power and the staff of the uh, US delegation for the support. Um, Ambassador Power has been voiced the voice of the voiceless in Syria and we appreciate all of her leadership. And I thank the esteemed members of the United Nations Security Council for the resolutions that you have done about Syria, even though that they were not implemented. The children in Aleppo have no baby milk. The doctors have severe shortage of medicine, blood, sutures, and ventilators and people have no bread, meat, or cooking gas. Two days ago, a pregnant woman in her ninth month has bled to death at home. She could not go to the hospital. There were no cars to take her because it was not safe. There were no fuel for the cars. Hospitals and neighborhoods are bombed. And yesterday, there were more than 40 airstrikes and barrel bombings at the besieged city of Aleppo. The most important message that I want to convey to the ambassadors and the representatives here is the sense of urgency and responsibility. As a medical volunteer in the Syrian American Medical Society, my last mission to Aleppo was my fifth mission to the city since the beginning of the crisis. The Syrian American Medical Society, my organizations have programs inside Syria, throughout Syria, have refugee programs in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Turkey, and in Greece. Last year, we were able to treat 2.6 million patients in Syria and the neighboring countries. What I have seen in Aleppo is beyond words. I will show you some pictures, but you should not have allowed this to happen to the children of Aleppo. Paraphrasing a person who witnessed the siege of Stalingrad by the Nazis 74 years ago, when I entered the city, I thought that we were entering, entering hell, but it was not hell. It was 10 times worse than that. I'm echoing the pleas of my medical colleagues inside the city who are working day and night in the few remaining hospitals to save lives and heal victims of aerial bombing. They are risking their lives every minute to save lives. They deserve your support. They have been asking since the beginning of this crisis for two things, protection and unhindered access. Protection from airstrikes and the ability to evacuate their patients and get food and medicine to the people. They have neither. This last month of July, there were 43 attacks on healthcare facilities in Syria, 43. 15 of them in the besieged city of Aleppo an average of one attack every 16 hours. I have details of all of these attacks for people who are interested. Just to put these numbers in perspective, it took six months last year to produce the same number of these attacks. Every attack is a war crime. Every patient who dies because he has or she has no access to safe health care is the victim of a crime. Yesterday, a hospital in Milles Idlib was bombed. Ten people were killed, inclu including children and four medical staff. If this space continued, August will, be, will beat all records. This is a record that is a record of shame. It should shame all of us, especially the governments that can stop these attacks. I spoke to a nurse in Aleppo this morning called Bara'a. She's 21 years old. She's in the Department of Children an M2 hospital. And I asked her, what would you like me to convey to the esteemed members of the United Nations Security Council? She has been working for 36 hours nonstop. 
because of the shortage of medical staff and extreme pressure on the few remaining hospitals. Her hospital was targeted three times in the past four weeks. The hospital take care of children, women, and patients with chronic diseases. She told me that four children were injured this last week and they died because they could not be evacuated. She told me that they are running of sutures, painkillers, anesthesia medications, antibiotics, and hope. Do you know what, what, her, what was her main concern? I asked her that I am, as, my, I am speaking to the most powerful body in the world today. What would you like me to tell them? No fly zone, peace, ending the crisis. Do you know what she told me? She wanted this body to help in evacuating a child who is dying because of shortage of medicine. This child was injured by barrel bomb in Al Kalasa district in Aleppo. She is 10 years old. Her name is Shahid. She is on life support. There is no functioning CT scanner in Aleppo. She needs to be evacuated. Most likely she has bleeding into her brain. There is no functioning CT scanner for 300,000 people under siege. She told me that the mother of, of, of this child comes every day and speaks to her daughter. She tells her that she will go home and ride her bicycle. Can you at least help evacuating Shahid and the other 150 patients stuck in Aleppo while being bombed? I don't have to tell you what you need to do. I think everyone in this room understands what needs to be done. We don't need condemnation, prayers, or pointing fingers. We had enough of that. You should meet, I ask you to meet the people of Aleppo and see them as humans. I have one request besides saving Shahid. Visit Aleppo yourself and meet with its doctors, nurses, and patients. If three doctors from Chicago were able to do that, you can do it. Nurse Bara'a, Dr. Fatima, and the children who survived the bombing and siege will be waiting for you. I am confident that the great city of Aleppo and its people will survive the siege and the bombing the same way that Stalingrad did. And I would like to go over my uh, slides if possible. So this is, this is Ahmad Hijazi, five years old. I took care of him. He was the first child when I went to uh, M10 Hospital, which is the hospital I went to. It's uh, built underground. And Ahmad had a barrel bomb that and the shrapnel severed his spinal cord and his chest. And he was on life support for the first three days. One day after I left, he had a cardiac arrest and died. Five years old. His death is preventable. Next, please. This is his CT scan of the chest. The CAT scan at that time was functioning, and as you see, if you're a doctor, there is a contusion in his lung. So the shrapnel penetrated his spinal cord and his lung. This is a child. The CT scan that you see in this picture stopped working one week after I left, and right now the 300,000 people in Aleppo do not have a CT scanner. So anyone who has bleeding into the brain or the belly or the chest, the doctors will not be able to diagnose that and treat these patients. Next. This is Fatima, 25 years old. She was in her home with her three children, Abdo, nine years old, Mahmoud, seven years old, and Ilaf, three years old. She had two barrel bombs, as it is the tradition in Aleppo. The regime throw the first one. When people gather to uh, evacuate the victims, they throw another one to kill as many people as possible. She had internal bleeding, and she is pregnant in her third month. Her baby is dead. She was on life support when I took care of her. I'm a critical care specialist that I deal with life and death every day in Chicago. But it's very difficult to deal, to take care of these patients who you know that they should not be in this situation. Her two children, Abdo, nine years old, and Ilaf, were pulled dead from under the rubble. Next. This is her surviving child, Mahmoud. I saw him in the emergency room, and he tried to smile. Next. 35 physicians remained in the city of Aleppo. Nine of them are surgeons and two are ob physicians. There is one physician for every 8,570 people in the city of Aleppo compared to one physician for 350 patients in the United States. So imagine the stress on these um, doctors. Next. 
This is the impact of one of the barrel bombing on M2 hospital in the city of Aleppo that happened just last week. And as you see, one of the ambulances was bombed. Three ambulances actually in this attack was bombed. Next. This is what you see when you go in the city of Aleppo. You see children pointing to the sky and they point to a helicopter or an, uh, a jet. And I've seen this situation myself and I saw a dot, a dark dot in the sky and you hear the sound of the helicopter, the rumbling sound. And this, this small dot will throw another dot, which is the barrel bomb. A, bomb, a barrel that is stuffed with 500 or half a ton kilogram of TNT and metal shrapnels that can destroy a block. The second picture is of the children of a Hamami family who are sleeping in the washroom or the bathroom because this, they think it's the safest place in the house. They sleep there every night. And this is one of the victims of the barrel bombing last week, the third picture. Next. Hula, the first child on the left, lost her mom in a barrel bombing last week. And the nurse in M2 hospital, Bara'a, is trying to help her and clean her after she was pulled from under the rubble. The other two children, as you see, are a victim of other barrel bombing. And Batul, the third ch child on the left, had internal bleeding in the chest and belly from barrel bombing. This happened last week. Next. These are children from the city of Saraqib who had exposure to chemical agent, to chlorine, just last week. And they were brought to the hospital in Saraqib with symptoms of severe respiratory distress because of exposure to chlorine. So chemical weapon is still being used in Syria. And this is, these are the victims. Next. And this is one of the last pictures, the picture of Shahid. On the, this is the child I told you about, 10 years old, a victim of barrel bombing on life support who needs to be evacuated. The first picture on the left, this is someone who you can save. The second picture is a, a picture of Fatima. I took care of her uh, in M2. She has this ability. She's mute and deaf to start with, and she had also bleeding into her brain. And luckily, we had a surgeon that could operate it on her, and she survived. The CT scanner that was able to help this child is not functioning anymore. And if you can help to arrange a CT scanner for the city of Aleppo, you will save many lives. And the third child is something that is the victim, someone who is the victim of uh, the shortage and the, and the siege. As you see, this child, Muhammad, nine years old, is being ventilated manually because there are no more ventilators in the city of Aleppo. So you had to ventilate this patient manually to keep him alive. Next. This is a picture of the market. Uh, I was in Aleppo one week before the siege, and at that time there were fruits and vegetables, not anymore. Next. And this is an orphanage that I visited, orphanage that is underground. Forty children in that orphanage uh, had no parents. And they had a play for us, for the three doctors coming from Chicago. And during this play, they were talking about the fear, their fear that they may have to eat uh, grass and tree leaves and cat meats the same way that children of Madaya had to suffer. Unfortunately, their fear became a reality. Next. This is a child that lost his leg because of barrel bombing. And this is what's left from his clothing. Next. And this is a cat that is also a victim of barrel bombing. She's being treated in M10 hospital. This is the same hospital that I spent time and Dr. Attar spent time in. And people and nurses and doctors still have time to heal animals in spite of the stress and the fact that they are working nonstop. Next. And this is the last picture. These are the children of Aleppo. This is a picture that was taken today from Nurse Bara'a. She took care of their mom. Their mom was a victim of barrel bombing, but she survived it. And these children came and smiled to her, and they say hello to every one of you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Zahir. Um, OK, 